Hi, this is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Max Tsunami podcast. This week, my co-hosts are both on Easter vacation, uh, one skiing in the Alps and the other one with a bad knee watching her family ski in Vancouver and enjoying everything British Columbia has to offer. So instead of pulling together a full episode, what we did was we recorded a conversation with Mike Patel from the Fatty Liver Alliance, kind of a follow-up to the LinkedIn that we posted last Saturday morning from the Liver Forum 16 meeting in Bethesda, Maryland. And that will be it for today. We'll be back next Monday with a full episode, and I hope you enjoy our conversation. Take care. Bye-bye. Now, here are Mike and Roger. So I'm here this afternoon with Mike Patel, my uh, my bagel brother, my brother from another mother, and the guy with whom I've never lost a word. So we're going to see how it works out this time. Hey, Mike, how are you this afternoon? I'm good. I'll try and let you talk today. Well, no, actually, <laughs> I, I, you don't have to do that. In fact, I think I'd probably be just as happy to let you talk. So what I wanted to do is I just wanted to take a few minutes, maybe 10, 15 minutes, and share with some of our listeners general impressions that we had of liver form. We did a short little video on one key thought, which was really well received. And that's what led me to want to do this again, maybe for 15 minutes. Obviously, the liver form rules are you can't share data, but you can talk about what you heard and kind of what it made you think about. So let me start with the point that you made on our joint five minute LinkedIn that people liked, which is the importance for convergence and congruence and everybody working together. Were there specific topics in the conference where you thought that was more important or more true? Or is that kind of a general feel? Well, first of all, I think it was the point of the conference, really. I mean, it's called the Forum for Collaborative Research. So, you know, it's about sharing ideas about research and sharing ideas and trying to collaborate in a way that will allow synergies uh, so that we're not doing the same things on our own that other people, other colleagues might be working on. I mean, to answer your question specifically, there was discussions about clinical trial work, um, non-invasive testing, which I think is critical because that's really the future as well. And a few other things, which I'm sure that you'll talk about next. Uh, Maybe. Yeah, I'm full of surprises today. It's a surprise kind of day, but maybe that. At any rate, so as I understand it, the the forum focuses largely around, or to be part of it, you have to in some way be engaged with uh, supporting regulation regulatory issues directly or indirectly, right? So patient advocates become supporters of regulatory issues because without patient input, it's very hard to figure out what they should actually do in trials to make them work. I don't know why I'm there. I guess I'm there because folks listen to the podcast and learn. Um, we know there are a couple of folks in the FDA and EMA who are on our list, our follower list. So maybe it's so that I can spread the right propaganda or maybe uh, it's just it, it's helpful to be there. At any rate, where I was going with this is that if you think about the different initiatives that they talk about, most of those in some way, shape or form have to do with tasks that will improve knowledge knowledge around regulatory approvals or, or trial designs or EMA acceptance points, that would be very hard for one company to do alone. For example, the placebo project, placebo on project, right? Nobody is going to build as big a placebo database as you could build if you pulled multiple databases together, for example. But that has its own complications, right? I mean, we talked about that a little bit while we were there. Everybody who has a trial will not have the same placebo elements in it. So we need a certain amount of integration and then we need focus. I guess my question to you would be, as a patient advocate who supports patient organizations around the world, where you see patient advocacy or what you took out of the meeting on specific topics where you thought your advocacy can bring benefit and how you see that happening. If, if the point on one hand is for us to collaborate in ways that makes it easier to move regulatory issues forward, right? You mentioned NITs, for example. Where do you see the role of patient advocacy or patients in supporting that? Patients are the end point of everything that we're all working on. So the input from patients, and these are discussions that are not just at the forum, but also on other meetings that we've been to. One of the key topics, as an example, is the inclusion of patients in, in clinical trial design. And that's an example of a really critical situation that pharma needs to consider, because if they want to improve the particular participation rate, the compliance rate for patients on studies, they have to make sure that they take into consideration everything that they're struggling with. And, you know, that could be access to get time off of work, or it could be because there's geographic challenges, other financial related issues that they have, could be family issues. And so I, I do think that patients are important from that perspective with regard to clinical trial design. And that's something that is not only talked about here, like I said, it, but, but other conferences as well. Well, that, that makes sense. In the aftermath of the approval of a drug, how do we rethink clinical trials? Right. I think you and I might have talked about that a little bit in Bethesda. I mean, really, there are three issues here. Number one is since you can get Resdifero 
without a biopsy. It means the only time a patient needs a biopsy anymore is if they're going into a clinical trial. Uh, biopsy is not an attractive option, so it, it, it's not exactly an incentive to participate in trials. Second disincentive to participate in trials is you might get placebo. You, some people will get placebo. And whereas different efficacy might not be 100%, but if you gave me and I were a patient a chance between getting a drug that was approved that might work and going into a trial where I might get a placebo, and I don't know how well the other group is going to work anyway, I might be inclined to go with the bird in hand as compared to the, the two in the bush, to use that particular metaphor. One of the topics that pharmaceutical companies are going to have to discuss is whether they're going to offer, after the study is finished, the patients that were on placebo, other maybe already approved options for treatment, because you're going to continue to have new investigational drugs all the time. I agree with you. If there's an approved treatment available that is much easier to access than what you have to go through for a clinical trial, people might be more inclined to just take the easier route and, and get what they can. Yeah. So there are two options, right? One is the easier route and the other is placebo. So in, in terms of placebo, the way that's dealt with is that once a drug is deemed a standard of care, then that replaces placebo in the control arm. And at that point, you make that problem go away. But now I don't know the process by which they decide that resmeter. First of all, we've got bunches of trials going on now. So even if from here on out, everybody decided to put a resmeter arm in the trial, it wouldn't help the people who are out doing trials right now. But that's a key question. So who makes a decision? Maybe it's the FDA, you can tell me, but who makes a decision when something is a standard of care and then replaces a placebo? Like, when does it become unethical to, to treat with a placebo when there's another drug that works better than a placebo? I don't know the answer to that, although I know we're not there now. And in fact, I'm teeing this up for an episode within the next month that I'm hoping you'll be part of on this particular topic in greater detail, where we sit down with some people from industry and some people from academia and, and trial design and spend an hour talking about that. Because it's an issue that everybody anywhere in fatty liver space should be thinking about right now. It's relevant immediately. I did not ask the question at the forum. I did think about it so I can talk about what I was thinking about. I was thinking about asking the question, when does it become unethical to use a placebo when there's an approved drug on the market? I don't think that answer was given specifically that I recall. Well, no, the answer that was given was standard of care. It was that once a drug is deemed standard of care, then placebo is not an ethical treatment option. I don't believe anybody discussed how that happens, and I'm not aware. So if anybody hears this and they'd like to educate Mike and me and our audience on this, send me a note and I'll get us together on video or audio and we can talk about it and I'll put that up on uh, all the various places that we go, kind of like we're going to do with this conversation. There were presentations there from regulatory agencies and one of the points they were simply trying to do is educate on how trials will evolve and one of the things they pointed out is that when there's a standard of care, that that replaces placebo. You know, and I think that's widely known. What I don't know is how that determination is made. I would like to know that as well. I think it's important uh, moving forward. I agree and we'll wrestle with that issue a little bit, as well as the question of biopsy. And the third question, which is if approval is conditional until you finish your outcomes trial, and here I may just misinform, but it's been my impression that the outcomes trial has to have placebo in it also, that you don't immediately cross everybody who's in the placebo group over to the trial group for phase four. Now, I could be wrong on that. Or there may be a period of time that a drug has to be out to be considered that standard of care. I also don't know that. So these are things... Well, that we the standard should... of care is one issue. The other issue is right now, when um, various Meister trials go into phase four, do the placebo patients cross into the trial group, start on the drug, and we simply track outcomes over time, or do they stay on placebo? You know, you raise a really good question, too, because when you're just talking about these clinical trial designs that they go on for years and years and years, you know, this is not a short-term answer that patients are getting. So you asked earlier about patient advocacy, and so, you know, our concern would just be making sure that the patients are, and, and they are if they're in a clinical trial, but care for during that entire time and... And, you know, and that they end up with a resolution that they're happy with and that works for them. Yes, I get they that. They don't respond. They don't respond. That's a whole other question. I forget whether it was an episode that you were on or a year end conversation. I think it was an episode that you were on where we were talking about this issue. And I asked the question, Wayne Eskridge said, uh, the day a drug got approved, if I could be on it, I'd be on it. The heck with the trials. Now, he can't be on it. We've talked about that with him because he's, he's already uh, at four. But I, I think that that's a pretty common attitude. If somebody tells you you've got a disease and it will slowly kill you and, we're not tra and we can't track exactly where it's at because it, at one point it turns south and then life gets ugly, but you don't have all that much warning necessarily, then you would think it would be intimidating for patients. I'd like to go back to 
uh, what the reason that we were talking about the forum in the first place too is just to really focus on the fact that having a group of people together in one room where everyone is focused on the same thing and that is how can we establish norms and benefit from this collaboration so that people aren't reproducing the same work over and over again and that there may be things that we can do to save time and save impact to patients. I think that's a good point. That's number one. The second is there are situations where it's not efficient or economically appropriate for anyone to develop the mega data set that you might want if you collect everybody's placebo patients together, which is why the placebo project is one of the things they're doing. The assumption being you can assemble a larger data set that way of untreated patients. And over time, hopefully, if there are standards for that, and this is a challenge, but if there are standards for that, then you might be able to test your drug against a placebo that is the composite data set of multiple earlier trials, either phase twos or phase three drugs that failed, or even I would presume if a phase three trial completes and patients do not go on to phase four and the drug is successful, then I would assume without knowing that those patients might be a placebo pool as well. But I think that one of the issues is where does mass have value? And then the other issue is, as you point out exactly, is where does a 360 degree view going to do a lot better than anybody's slice of vision? Yeah. And you know what? This is a great time to raise another concern. I voiced it a couple of times, not necessarily in a big forum, but this is a good opportunity to talk about it with you to see what your thoughts are. I very strongly believe that the placebo in any of the clinical trials is a better care model than the general public is getting when they are not on a placebo. So they are getting monitored. They are encouraged to show up for their appointments and obviously know that they're going to have, for example, their waist circumference measured or their weight measured. And they're getting behavioral support in many cases. And this is great and ethical, but is it a placebo really? Is that really is that really the real world perspective? It's a great question. Okay. And in fact, I think it was Mr. Fit, one of the early trials in the 60s that set research on cholesterol back 20 years was a trial where they did that and there was no difference between the groups. And it turned out not that the drug didn't necessarily work, but that by getting people to adhere to lifestyle, they made such a difference that it swamped the effect of the drug. Now, that's the kind of thing you're talking about. So even more so, I think that's one of the reasons why some drugs may not show a delta between the placebo and as much of a delta as they would. If they actually had three arms, which again, I guess it's not ethical to do that, but if you had a third arm that was just wide watching without any intervention, and then you had the placebo group like they've been doing, and then you had the, you know, the the active ingredient group, that there would be differences in those two There probably would, but the active ingredient group now has two benefits against the placebo group. One is the drug and the second is standard of office care. So you really would need to do that. You'd need to have four groups. You'd need to have a two by two. You've got drug intervention, lifestyle intervention. Yes, 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 no, no, yes, no, no. So I think the answer is if the definition of placebo is what happens if you replace an active moiety with a dummy drug, then the clinical trial is exactly right, because the goal is to give everybody the same care. Therefore, you're completely apples to apples or apples to placebos, if you will, on the drug. Now, your question is, will the drug perform better versus untreated patients in the real world than it will in the clinical trial where the untreated patients have lifestyle benefits? That's a question of how good the treating physicians and their advanced care providers are of providing that kind of access. Look, have you ever been in a clinical trial? Me neither. I've observed a bunch from my old career. And the care that folks in trials are given is massively better than and the patients given the drug will get. In the real world. In the real world. The, yeah. You know, a primary care doc writes or suvastatin for somebody or torvastatin. They're not going to get the kind of support and diet support and monitoring and blood draws and all that stuff all the time that you get if you were in a clinical trial back in phase three. Okay. So back to one of your earlier questions, one of the best outcomes from this type of meeting would be if somehow, and maybe it comes from the patient advocacy groups to work with physicians and, cl- and clinical research sites, how do we, especially after a drug is approved, how do we ensure that patients that are going to, going on therapy are going to get all of that supportive care so that they can do well, so that they can have high compliance and succeed? First of all, I hate to be uh, Debbie Downer. I doubt you can. I doubt you can. <laughs> Okay, start here. Yeah. Okay, the typical, I don't know how long the typical patient visit in the middle of a clinical trial is, but I'm sure it's more extensive and more gets done than a typical office visit. Okay, so right now the focus is on clinical care pathway, which isn't to get every patient treated the way they get treated in the trial. It's simply to do a better job of triaging patients. So only the patients that need care really get to a hepatology practice or gastro practice. And what will happen, I guess Wayne talked about this when he talked about the issue of gastro in our recent episode, is that gastro will get swamped. And this isn't what they want to do. They like doing scopes. They don't like doing this. So they're going to need advanced care providers or digital health interventions to support all that. By the time you get out to primary care, there's even a lot less than that. My primary care doc is pretty good and I'm on a statin and I'm on antihypertensive. 
And that's 30 seconds of our average visit, maybe 45. Maybe this is one of those topics at future liver forums that we could have as well, is just to say how to maintain that standard of care. Well, now you get to the point that goes, if the liver form mission is regulatory, probably not. The, the better thing to do with that would be to talk to the various professional societies and talk about how do we bring that conversation into all the various meetings? How do we bring that conversation not only to easel and to ASLD, but how do we bring it to ADA? How do we bring it to ACE? How do we bring it to American Heart? And those are all groups that are committed and want to help. And they've all signed on to the clinical care pathway documents. So then the question becomes, all right, so what is the role really? And I don't think that's a liver form. I, I think you're right. It's a pivotal integration issue. I'm not sure that's exactly the venue for it, but I, I think the issue is, pivot, is, is vitally important. I agree with you totally. A lot of the people there are the same people that are out in the world that's, as well, yeah. but yeah. But, but <laughs> that's fair. All right. Th that's kind of everything I got right now. You've got to get on the road and I will go back and I will make sure this is appropriately edited and then I will send it out to the world. We'll see what they say. Roger, thanks as always. It's a pleasure having this opportunity. Right. Thank you. you. Every, every opportunity to speak with you is a pleasure, my brother. Thanks. Talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye right. now. Have any questions for the surfers? You can send them to questions at surfingmash.com and we will answer on the podcast or website. Your question might even wind up being the question of the week. <laughs> <laughs>